She is. Okay. So now we're going to move into what is one of the best parts of the forum program for us. Thank you. And uh, we're going to start with the Shoemaker Medal Award. So just to remind you, uh, although who could ever forget, Dr. Eugene Shoemaker was a pioneer of lunar, lunar and planetary geoscience. He inspired a generation of researchers studying the solar system. During a long, highly productive career with the U.S. Geological Survey um, uh, in California and Arizona, he analyzed in detail the formation process for impact craters. He was especially interested in using cratering rates to develop the chronologies for the moon, the earth, and the inner planets. The Shoemaker Distinguished Scientist Medal is an annual award given by SERVI, the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute, to a scientist who has significantly contributed to the field of lunar or asteroid science throughout the course of their scientific career. Before I bring up this year's recipient, I would like to tell you a little bit about her, but this year's recipient is Dr. Maria Zuber. Maria is the Vice President of Research at MIT. She's also the E.A. Griswold Professor of Geophysics, and uh, she oversees the MIT Lincoln Laboratory. This has more than a dozen interdisciplinary research laboratories and centers. Her research bridges planetary geophysics and the technology of space-based laser and radio systems. Since 1990, she has held leadership positions associated with scientific ex experiments or instrumentation on 10 NASA missions. She was the first woman to lead a NASA planetary mission, and she did so in a most extraordinary manner. She holds a BA from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's degree and PhD from Brown University. Now, all of these facts one could look up readily enough. But as impressive as they are, including a long list of publications, a long list of honors and awards, they're staggering for someone so young, by the way. <clears throat> Ahem, we're the same age. Uh, uh, but, but all of that aside, I want to tell you a little bit about the reason that I'm personally so in awe of my friend and colleague, Maria Zuber. She doesn't know this, but I've listened to a number of interviews that she's given. I really enjoy them. And for all of the students in the room, I really encourage you to make her one of your role models and go and listen to some of these. So I resonate with a lot of what makes her tick, and I bet a bunch of you will too. The Apollo program definitely inspired her, but she was different. She wasn't just inspired by the Apollo program. No, it started with Maria even before that. When she was seven and eight years old, she was building telescopes. And it's been said that when she was in her playpen, she would jump up and down whenever something came on TV that was space related. So once bitten by the space bug, she never deviated from her plan to be part of NASA and to be part of space. That's the part I resonate with. I was just exactly the same way, and I know many of you were, too. So we think that she may have been genetically encoded uh, to explore space. For all the students out there, the other lesson you can take away from Maria is that she did her homework. She prepared. She did the hard stuff. When she was an undergraduate, she took so many of her astronomy and astrophysics courses that she completed basically everything before she was a senior. So in her senior year, she took geology and geophysics courses because she liked them. And she was able to complete a double major by doing that. When you do something like that, you open the world of possibilities. You create so many options for yourself and for the world. Because look at how the world is benefiting from the hard work that she did then. 
This set her up with incredible options for her first postdoc or first job, and her first job ended up being a postdoctoral position at Goddard. Now, at Goddard Space Flight Center, they chose to make her a civil servant after just one year. This is rare. I mean, being a career civil servant scientist, I can tell you, it just doesn't happen that often. Normally, people go through several postdocs. After one year, they made her a civil servant. And she found a like-minded group of young people that she could work with, and they did some really clever things that I won't go into now, but it enabled them to win a $10 million proposal to build an instrument that would go on to Mars. And this is all, remember, just two years out of graduate school. I mean, this is really unheard of. Um, oh, and I, I skipped over a, a piece I wanted to tell you that after, after going to Penn and doing the double major, uh, she was looking for a university for her PhD where she could combine all of her interests, and she found a great one because she went to Brown University. And at Brown, she was able to combine the geology, the geophysics, the astronomy, the engineering, all of that. And that is what led to her having all of these incredible options when it was time to move out and have her first job. Okay, so now I jump back to, um, to her, her, you know, her professional career. So two years out of graduate school, she wins this, uh, this award, I mean this uh, proposal, and she's able to build this instrument. The instrument was so successful that that type of, of instrumentation was used on many missions afterwards. In fact, until just recently, just a couple of years ago, this was uh, uh, the laser alt altimeter, I believe it is, that, uh, that people used for many, many years. Uh, she became a full professor at both Johns Hopkins, John Hopkins University and MIT in the same year. I do not know anybody who does this. This is her story to tell, and it's a good one, but it's fascinating. But all I'm trying to do is, again, emphasize to all of you students in the room, all that hard work really paid off. She's capable, she's brave, she's creative, and she knows how to lead people. She won this very prestigious award at MIT recently for faculty members, and this is an award that shows that she could lead and she could keep teams together. On the GRAIL mission, which I would claim is probably the, you know, the part of her career that is, is really the all-time high point to me, she led a team that stayed together uh, through, throughout. Um, they, let's see, they, the things I wanted to tell you is she led a team over several years to develop a mission to determine the structure and interior of the moon from crust to core. They delivered the mission on budget and on time. That's pretty rare. The GRAIL payload was delivered three weeks ahead of time, and the GRAIL orbiters were shipped one week ahead of time. GRAIL studied the thermal evolution of the moon, which is so critical to explaining the early history that affects not only the moon, but also the history of the early Earth. I'm sure you're going to hear more about Grail in a moment, but I just I want to brag a little bit more about her just to say the part about team building and leadership and keeping people together. These are things that it are really hard to learn. I think they have to be innate. So just as the genetically encoded urge to study space was encoded in her, I think also uh, her compassion and understanding of people must have also been there, or maybe it was the incredible upbringing that inspired her in such a wonderful way. But I'm just as proud as I can be that this year, Survey is awarding the Shoemaker Medal to Dr. Maria Zuber. Maria, thank you.
very much. Okay, so now I've asked Maria to say a few words. You have to. Oh, I have a whole talk. Yep. Okay. Just want to make sure you know. Great, thank you. Could you uh, bring my talk up? So, uh, God, that's one of the nicest uh, things anybody has ever said about me. So, um, so thank you so much. It's so uh, I can't even begin to tell you how meaningful it is to um, receive this award from uh, Yvonne, who has been just such a great uh, colleague, friend, and supporter. So, um, so I'm going to talk today um, about uh, lunar impact cratering. And I'm going to do this uh, in three acts. If I could have the next uh, chart, please. So, um, but, uh, but to start off, I want, to, I want to give the credits to this talk first. So I really don't know what I think about this idea of giving individual awards in team sports, um, because uh, everything that I have ever accomplished uh, has been because of who I've worked with. And you know, I've often said that if I have one talent, um, it's just deciding the right people to work with. And um, so there's been so many friends, family, students, um, mentors, uh, the Survey family, um, our Survey group, uh, the joint MIT Brown group, um, which is going to figure significantly into this. And, um, and in the mentors, um, I was very fortunate to count uh, Jean and Carolyn Shoemaker uh, among the people who, who inspired me. And uh, if we could have the next chart. Please. So, um, so the the story that I want to tell today actually looks at at the three lunar missions that I've worked on: um, Clementine, or the Deep Space Program Science Experiment, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, where we had uh, the LOLA uh, laser altimeter experiment, and Grail to study lunar gravity. And um, and let's see. Next slide, please. And um, and I really um, haven't given a talk before. Um, where I've uh, really emphasized the role that the Clementide mission had in, um, I, I think, formulating uh, the measurements that we really wanted to make for the moon and the scientific questions um, that we wanted to ask. So next uh, chart, please. OK, so, um, so uh, Yvonne mentioned that, um, uh, that pretty early on in my career, we got really lucky. and. One uh, a laser altimeter uh, was competitively awarded to to go to Mars, um, and it was on this fantastic mission called Mars Observer. Okay, and uh, so for the young people in the room, Mars Observer was lost three days um, from Mars, and um, and uh, while that was going on, um, the um, Ballistic Missile Defense Organization. It was while Ronald Reagan was president. And um, they were investing billions of dollars a year into laser technology. And, um, and so uh, they wanted to test these sensors in space, but doing them in Earth orbit violated uh, an anti-ballistic missile treaty. So they decided to go to the moon okay, and test them there. And, um, and this mission was led by um, uh, for, uh, Air Force Colonel um, Pete Rustan. Um, Pete uh, was Cuban, and he escaped from Cuba by swimming across Guantanamo Bay. He got a PhD in lightning, and he was just an amazing um, leader. And, uh, and they, um, so this was a ballistic missile defense mission, but uh, they teamed with NASA, and they decided to select a science team. And so uh, we, uh, Dave Smith, Greg Newman, Frank Lemoyne, and myself, we uh, decided to put in a proposal to this. And, and people said, what would you want to write this proposal on this DOD mission with these lousy sensors when you've got this amazing instrument that's going to Mars? And, um, and it was just like, well, you just never know where the answer is going to be. So Mars Observer was lost. Um, and. Um, and so we had the opportunity to focus um, on the, the Clementine um, mission. And I remember uh, I was actually flying out to the West Coast, and I wrote the whole proposal, um, this whole science section of the proposal, on one flight from Washington Dulles to LA, and then cleaned it up on the flight back. And, um, and uh, we won. OK. Um, so that, that's the bat cave there. That's the operations center of Clementine. And, it, and this picture doesn't do it justice, because you really can't see the barbed wire um, around this. And, um, and so every uh, night, 
um, I would. Um, so the, uh, we weren't allowed to send out the data on this because it was a ballistic missile defense mission. So I remember the first data that came from the laser altimeter from the Clementine spacecraft in orbit. Um, I was at a meeting at Ames and I had a drive up to SFO and get pick up floppy disks for, at the cargo uh, area and bring them back and we saw they got the first photons from the moon and then I flew back, um, went to the bat cave and Pete, uh, we had a science room upstairs and Pete came in and he took me downstairs and he said we have now accomplished the military requirement of this instrument and he gave me a key into a locked room and said, here's a computer, here's a file, this contains all the parameters for the laser altimeter, it is now your instrument, this is a science instrument, I want you to map the whole moon, okay? And, uh, and by the way, there's all these other files in here to control all the other instruments, don't, and, and the spacecraft, don't touch any of those. But, um, and um, so that's uh, what happened. Next uh, slide, please. So. Um, so there's the instrument, and, um, and uh, what we were able to do, um, those are the, the ground tracks that we got. The, uh, the spacecraft was in an elliptical orbit with the um, original periapsis at minus 30. Al McEwen, I believe, had the idea to move the periapsis to plus 30 so that we were able to um, uh, map uh, the moon with not only the laser altimeter but other sensors as well. This was, a, uh, this was not an altimeter, it was a laser ranger, and it was designed to track dark metallic objects, okay? And um, 170 millijoules, it had a 14-bit counter in it, so the minimum range resolution that we had was 40 meters, okay? Um, but if you don't have global data for the moon, and what we had in terms of laser altimetry was from the Apollo 15 laser, 15 and 17, laser altimeters, um, then you can learn some things. So the next uh, chart here um, shows, um, let's see if you can go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, shows the topography, the gravity that we got from the tracking system. These are Mala-wide projections, so the uh, near side of the moon is on the left, the far side is on the left, the near side is on the right, the far side is on the left that you're looking at. Um, you can see the stripiness on the far side in the gravity, which was due to the fact that we had, um, we didn't have direct tracking um, on the moon. But we were able to produce topography and gravity fields to degree in order um, 72, which is a spatial block size of about um, 75 kilometers, and we were able to calculate the orbits of the spacecraft um, around uh, the moon to 100 meters, so that was really the accuracy. And the next chart shows, um, this shows topography, gra uh, free air and bouguet gravity, um, which is the gravity after we attract, uh, correct for topography, and crustal thickness for the Oriental Basin, and I remember sitting next to Jack Schmidt uh, at a lunar science conference, lunar and planetary science conference, uh, before I went up to talk about Oriental, and I showed him the map, and um, uh, boy, was he he was as excited um, as I was about it. So, um, so we were able to do a first sort of quasi-global map of topography, gravity, crustal thickness, and then um, we always thought the the lunar mass cons, which were these very high. Um, amplitude, um, uh, positive gravity anomalies associated with the lunar basins, we thought they were due to the fill of the mare, okay? And we always assumed that after we removed the gravitational attraction of the mare, um, that all of the lunar basins would be isostatic, which would mean they, they, they were, these impacts occurred very early in the moon when the moon was uh, very hot, and we thought all the uh, stresses would have relaxed away. But we learned with Clementine that we subtracted, we subtracted away the mare fill, and, um, and the basin still had major gravity anomalies, which indicated that the moon was surprisingly strong um, very early. And we never understood, um, actually, then what these mass cons were, because we didn't really understand um, why the moon would have strength. Um, early on, and this was really something that guided uh, our thinking um, in the future. So the next chart, um, this is where Gene Shoemaker comes into the picture. 
because when Clementine was going to leave the room, Jean led the Clementine science team and did a brilliant uh, job of it. And, um, and so there were two choices of what the Clementine mission would do um, at the end. It would either leave the moon and go to an asteroid Geographos, encounter uh, uh, the asteroid Geographos, Graphos, or what Gene wanted to do, and, uh, and by extension what got the science team so excited, was to do a low altitude pass over the Prosolarum Basin um, and study the subsurface at a low altitude um, so that we could map the Maria and map, was map what was beneath the Maria. So, um, so Pete uh, Rustan um, said, okay, well let's have a presentation on each of those two options and then we'll make a decision. And so, um, for whatever reason that I don't understand, Jean asked me to do the presentation to justify Procolarum. So I remember uh, going down to the Bat Cave, and there was a little deli across the street um, from the Bat Cave, and we were sitting there having lunch, and Jean and Shoemaker were there when we came in. And he says, Maria, look, we don't have a chance, okay? The Air Force wants to go to Geographos because they want to test out autonomous navigation. So they're not going to let us do this pass at Procolarum, but I want you to go across the street and go into that meeting, and I want there to be tears in their eyes that they're going to turn us down and not map Procolarum. Okay. So, I, yes, Jean, I will do this, you know. So, um, so I went across, I gave a presentation. It was a much better presentation than I'm giving right now, okay? <laughs> and it was going really, 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 really well. And the Air Force people in the room were going, oh, wow, this could be pretty good, seeing underneath the moon. And, and then somebody runs in. They called over to the Pentagon that this is going off the rails. And somebody rushes over from the Pentagon, comes into the room and says, that's it, we're done, we're going to Geographos. So, um, so uh, we didn't do our uh, Procolarum exper experiment. Clementine left the moon, didn't make it to Geographos because they had a, an upset. Um, uh, and the uh, mapping the subsurface of uh, Maria um, had to wait for another day. So next, uh, next chart. Okay, so now we're on um, Act 2, and this is going to be pretty short. Um, uh, we're going to talk about the Lunar Orbiter Laser Altimeter, or LOLA. Uh, next chart. So we, um, we wanted to go back again and, um, and do this, what I, what I call properly, but, um, but let me just say, you know, once you've done an experiment, you could always think about all the things that you should have done and would have done and ought to do and, um, and how you could make it better. And so Clementine was just amazing from that standpoint in terms of uh, giving us measurements and understanding us, what, helping us understand what the next step would be and, um, and, and showing us what we could go for. And our whole idea that we had in our minds is that we, we did the geophysics of the moon and others did other geological things. And we really wanted to bring those two together, the geophysics together with the geology. And one of the things that re was required for that to happen was to really improve the spatial resolution because geology often got done at scales of outcrops um, where geophysics was more thought uh, generally global. And so, um, so we developed an instrument um, uh, with our Goddard colleagues um, that had a 10 centimeter range resolution instead of a 40 meter range resolution. And this instrument is still collecting data right now. And so far, we have 6.9 billion good observations of the moon. And we're shooting to get one 7 billion, one for every person on Earth. Okay, and, um, But I'm a little bit worried that the birth rate is faster than the um, rate that we're collecting um, the, the data here now because uh, we're, um, we're in a, a, an orbit that's not very um, suitable for that right now. But we developed this instrument. Next slide. And, um, and so um, we were able to get um, a better topographic model. In fact, this topographic model is better um, than we have for the Earth um, right now. It's, um, the global DEM is, uh, is 60 meter pixels. Okay. Uh, next chart. So, and um, and this, is a, this is a shout out um, to our survey team um, because uh, while this was going on, both, um, both LRO and GRAIL 
um, we were uh, in the throes of our survey investigation. And here is my shout out to the Brown graduate students who digitized um, all the craters um, greater than um, 20 kilometers um, in diameter um, on the moon that we were able to do um, with this incredible topographic data set. So the next chart um, shows, um, uh, this is a paper that was led by Jim Head in Science showing um, that we can actually really measure crater densities very well, finding areas that are close to a state of statura saturation that found you know, the oldest areas of the um, lunar crust that if you wanted to go collect samples from areas that were the oldest areas of the crust, we now have some idea of where we ought to go to explore. And the next uh, chart, please. Um, so now um, I'm going to move quickly on um, to the, uh, the, the last part about GRAIL, but realizing that we needed both the topography and the gravity um, in order to make this uh, story come together. So the next uh, chart. So, um, so uh, we were able to solve the problem of not having direct tracking on the back of the moon, um, on the far side of the moon, um, because of uh, the fact that the moon is in a synchronous orbit. And um, so we put two satellites up there, one tracked each other, and uh, they did this at a 50 kilometer altitude. Then we brought it down a factor of two uh, to 23. Then we brought it down another a factor of two to 11. And we actually mapped Oriental from two kilometers above the lunar surface in orbit. So, um, so next uh, chart, please. And, um, and um, I just want to say here, is that in science, when you can do 10 and 20% better than other people have done and make a measurement, you discover things. Um, but our, um, we beat our data noise requirement by a factor of four. Um, this is the power of the lunar gravity field um, coming down like this. Um, coming up is the error spectrum. And you see there the error spectra for lunar prospector in Kaguya um, at the, um, at way, and the, long, uh, here, low degrees, spherical harmonic degrees and orders are long wavelengths. High spherical harmonic degrees and orders are short wavelengths. And so, um, so in, in, at um, wavelengths that are relevant to lunar basins, um, we improved uh, the errors by three to four or five orders of magnitude um, over Kaguya and, and Lunar Prospector. And we developed a degree and order um, 1800 um, uh, spherical harmonic model, and we actually promised to do a model of 180 degrees in orders in the original um, proposal. So, um, so, uh, and 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 there were people who doubted that we could do that. So, um, always um, under promise and over deliver is a is a great winning strategy. So, next uh, next chart. Um, so this is, on the left-hand side here, this is something called the coherence. And, um, and what this is, this is a comparison of gravity compared to um, what the, the uh, gravity would be if all the gravity were due to topography, okay? And, and what you see there is that for um, all the degrees and orders, um, except for those associated with the lunar basins, um, more then 98% of the gravity um, is associated with topography. And on the right-hand side, I break out the far side and the near side. And on the near side, you see the effect of the, the lunar basins there. And on the far side, you see um, that, uh, that um, uh, the, the gravity and topography are, are very, very coherent. And so what this indicates is that basically all the gravity you're seeing at most wavelengths is just due to the topography, and the crust is homogeneous. And, and this is basically a statement that the subsurface of the, the lunar crust has been homogenized by impact bombardment. So this is really the first time that we've really profoundly understood the role the impacts have played in, um, in uh, really breaking up planetary crusts. And the next slide uh, shows this is a non-geophysical way of talking about high coherence. Uh, what it means is that the gravity map looks just like the topography map. Okay, and, um, and so what is fascinating to me is that these two images, the left is topography, the right is gravity. Um, they're two different data sets. They were collected on two separate spacecrafts um, and, uh, and they're practically um, identical. So this is basically showing 
that virtually all that gravity there is due to the topography on the left. Um, right side, uh, the next slide, please. Okay, so, um, so we were able to make the same figure that we made for the Clementine paper that we wrote. Again, gravity, topography, crustal thickness, except now we had a spherical harmonic model. Instead of degree 76, it's degree in order 2,500. Uh, the gravity out to degree in order 1,800. We did one meter orbits now, so this is how accurate the topography is. And, um, and, um, and here, um, doing things at this spatial scale really brought the geophysics down to the scale of the geology, which means we were able to really bring the geology in and make interpretations about the moon um, using geophysical um, data. All right, next uh, chart. Um, and we were able to do more than that um, because we were also um, able to use um, geophysical response function techniques um, to uh, get the density of the crust, um, which we showed was substantially less than had been assumed. And this actually had messed up our estimate of crustal thickness, so we redetermined uh, the crustal thickness value, we determined the porosity, and, um, and we're able to go in and look at variations of porosity and density that are associated with variations in melting um, and, uh, and really tease out more information on impact bombardment. So the next chart, um, um, we were also able to figure out the, um, the, what was going on with these mass cons that had these big gravity anomalies left after we um, subtracted away the, um, the gravitational attraction of the Maria. So, um, so here's a paper that Jay Malosh led, and, and actually Jay reviewed the original paper and says, I can't believe you're right about there still being gravity there, but it's data, so uh, I have to accept your results. And so he led the analysis that finally figured that out. So on the left is the Freundlich-Sharonov basin, which doesn't have Maria in it. And then on the right is the Mare-filled Humorum basin. Um, the uh, yellow uh, boxes are profiles of gray grail data. It's radially averaged. Um, the white uh, graphs, the white lines for each of those um, are the, um, the gravity that's predicted by um, hydrocode simulations of what the moon, what this basin, what these basins look like after the excavation and the collapse of the transient cavity. And you can see it doesn't look like the data. Um, but the, um, the red line um, in both of those shows what the gravity looks like um, after um, relaxation, uh, isostatic relaxation and cooling. And then if there's no Maria in there, then you can explain um, the gravity. But in the case where uh, there is then Mare filling, you have to do an, a, an additional correction, which on the right is in blue. And, um, and so now we're, we're basically able to fully reproduce the gravity signals um, of, uh, of Maria basins. And so, um, so we now understand um, really uh, in great detail um, what the role of, of many parameters is in, um, in and, uh, and then by then, uh, so, you know, reconstructing um, the, uh, both the thermal history um, uh, and the, uh, the cooling and also taking into account the uh, mechanical properties. Uh, next chart. Okay, um, we also, um, you know, I showed you that we were able to map uh, all the large craters um, using the topography, but we were able to map some that we were missing now that we had the gravity as well. So here's Freundlich Sharonov, and there it is on the left in topography, and there it is on the right in gravity. And the next chart, um, so here's, a, if we could have the next, uh, the next chart here. Now here's the, uh, a couple of more basins, and, um, and on the left you see the topography, which basically shows us one large basin. And on the right you see here that there's a, a basin that we didn't see on the surface because the whole topography has been modified by subsequent in in impacts. So we're, we were able to adjust what the population of impact basins was by looking at the subsurface. And uh, next uh, chart on the, um, and, um, and so Greg Newman um, then read a paper, uh, wrote a paper where the cumulative number of basins is a function of basin diameter and um, teased out the difference between the near and far side 
And, um, and there are really two different populations of basins on the near and far side. And, uh, and there shouldn't be, okay? And um, I don't have time to go into it, but this really led to um, uh, some simulation and modeling um, work um, that then showed that the thermal uh, anomalies uh, on the near side um, associated with the Procolarum creep terrain really led to different size basins being produced uh, during these early impacts. So again, informed our understanding of both the impact process um, as well um, as the lunar thermal history. So the next uh, chart, okay, um, we also, let's see, we also um, went back and did a very detailed um, study of the Oriental Basin. On the left-hand side is, uh, is uh, gradiometry, so we took the derivative um, of the, the gravity, gravitational field of Oriental, and if we could have the next chart, it just shows that this allowed us to map out um, uh, let's see, next time step allowed us to map out the ring structures on the moon. And, um, and we were able to show that for the outer rook ring and the Cordillera ring, um, that there were faults that likely were penetrating um, into the mantle. So really clarified our understanding of basin rings. Uh, next chart. Um, and finally, um, uh, there were a number of studies that we've done that we really did look now beneath the lunar maria like Gene Shoemaker had originally asked us to. And, um, and on the left-hand side, here's some work by um, my former graduate student, Alex Evans, showing um, the distribution of craters that are buried in the maria, beneath the maria, and then also um, calculations of the, the density of the lunar maria um, and the thickness of the lunar marias. Um, we also, again, using gradiometry, were able to um, find a polygonal pattern um, on the near side that turned out to be the plumbing system um, of the lunar maria. And the next uh, chart. Okay, so um, so this was what you can see is that we have ba what we have basically done um, is fulfilled Jean's wish now to look beneath the lunar maria. And then the final time step um, it really just shows the the plumbing system. Uh, uh, an artistic version um, of the plumbing system that we found um, with the gale, grail gravity. Um, but I, I think that this just shows um, how far ahead of his time Gene was in terms of trying to articulate uh, the kind of problems that one wanted to look at and the kind of things that you would have to do. We need to fly low over the moon to really get at what was going on beneath the surface. And so, um, and so it is so uh, deeply meaningful for me to be able to um, give this presentation uh, and honor Gene's memory here and, uh, and thank him for the good idea um, that we took, it took way too long to execute on. So thank you very much. Okay, we're, we're going to have a discussion session for all the speakers, but we can take one or two questions right now if anybody has one for Maria for this particular talk. Do we have any questions? Adele. What was your pitch to the folks who went through the speech to? What was your angle to get them to change their mind? Oh, the, uh, so what, what did we do to, um, um, well, we, we um, Okay, so the, the question was, what was your um, pitch, okay? And, um, and so the pitch that we were using, so first of all, these were, um, these were Air Force guys in the room. They weren't um, scientists. So, so this is, uh, so what we th thought about, and, and I actually used this pitch when we wrote the GRAIL mission too, is the, the, the idea that um, um, the moon is our, uh, closest neighbor, in fact, it's a family member, okay? And if you think about the people who mean the most to you and your family, it's not what they look like on the outside, it's what they're like on the inside that really um, makes them special. And so we wanted to really fly low over the moon um, in order to get the subsurface data to try to understand uh, the, the inner workings uh, of, our, of our family member, the moon. <laughs> Jim, Jim Head. So, Maria, at what age did you vault out of your spaceship? That's <laughs> so, um, 
So that's, that is actually, the, the question was, when did I vault out of my, so that, apparently that's actually a true story, that the, um, that I, I would just stand in my playpen, it was when all the Mercury missions were launching and the astronauts were spacewalking and doing rendezvous, and, and I would just, yeah, 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 yeah. So, and, um, and I'm still like that. <laughs> so. Thank you so much. Well, in the interest of time, we're going to move on, but let's thank Maria again.